001. I'm going to give everybody a second to join the webinar who signed up for it. If you have not signed up for this webinar and you're watching on Facebook or on YouTube, there is a link in the description that will send you there. So let me just make sure I'm live. And it looks like I am very good. All right, guys. Hopefully people are coming in. And let me know in the chat if you can hear me okay. Doesn't look like anybody's in the webinar. This might be a problem. Hang on one second. Hmm. Technical difficulty, difficulties. Give me one second here, guys. Let me just make sure people are able to get in to the webinar. Something's up. Let's see here. Yeah, we should be live. Okay, people are in. Okay, good. Sorry, I had to make sure. Oh, there you guys are. Okay, good. You can hear me. Yes, I saw zero people in. I'm like, oh my God, did I send the wrong link? There's always something when you go live. All right, so my name's Kathleen Jasper. It is 10 a.m. on a Saturday. Some of you are joining me inside the webinar, and if you would like to do that and download the resources that go with this webinar, there's a link in the description if you're watching online right now. It's the first link, and if you click that and sign up, you'll get the study guide that we're going to use today and you'll be able to come inside the webinar room so that you can chat. Now, a couple quick things before I get started. Number one, this is recorded. So if something happens with my internet, your internet, your kids come in and you can't attend the whole thing, no worries. When I am done, it will be available for replay. And if you sign up, through the um, form that, that you did, you will get a follow-up email in about an hour after the webinar is over and you will get all the information and all of that. So if something happens, um, don't worry about it. No big deal. You will be able to get this. Now, if you're watching live on Facebook or YouTube, I can't respond to you yet because I've got like 40 things going on here and you know, I'm a one woman show currently. So um, I have to prioritize. Okay. So I'm so glad all of you are in the chat. I think my mic is a little loud. Let's turn that down a little bit. There we go. Sounds a little bit better there. And um, okay. Thing about the chat when I'm presenting, it's hard for me to kind of chat and present. So what I'll do is I'll stop after each section and take questions and you can put it in the chat if you're in the live webinar and I will do my best to get to everyone. We do have a lot of people in the webinar, over 800 people signed up and we have right now about 65 lives. So that's a lot of people talking and, um, I will do my best to get to all the questions, all right? Now, really quickly, this webinar is for the Praxis 5001. That's the Elementary Education Multiple Subjects Test. I do have a book for this, and I will be using problems from this book. If you downloaded the study guide, you have the exact questions I'm going to be using in this um, webinar. So don't worry if you're like, where's the presentation? Your book, the study guide, the little free study guide that you downloaded with this is that I just blew it up. So it looked a little bit better for the viewing public. Okay. So this is the purple book. Now keep in mind, this is 500 pages. Okay. And today we're going to just do a snippet of that. All right. So if you're interested in getting the book really quick, and we'll get into the webinar, you can get it on my website here. There's also a button here to get it on Amazon and you can, Oh, I need to share screen. Please hold. Sharing screen. Here we go. Okay. So you can see that uh, this is where you get the book. You can also get the online course here. The online course comes with the book and you can buy individual sections. So if you passed one or more sections and you don't need all of them, you can buy individual sections. You can do that also in the study guide. So if you only need the math or you only need the reading and language arts, you can do that here. The physical study guide, you just click this little Amazon button. It'll take you here and you can see we have over 600 five-star ratings for this book. So it definitely works. But if you're, um, 
if you are trying to save money and you just want to do the free stuff, totally. The free stuff works. I have a YouTube channel with all kinds of stuff in it that will help you as well. So we have lots of different ways in which you can pass your exams. Okay. So no worries. I want to jump right into it now. Oh, one more thing. If you're taking the 5901 test, that is the exact same test as the 5001, but it just doesn't have the English language arts and reading. And you guys have to take, instead of the language arts and reading in the in the test, you have to take a separate reading exam. And I have a book for that. So anyway, I have books for a lot of things. And I also have a book, How to Teach. I just published it. I published it in the mi middle of the year. Some of you may not be ready for it until August, but I do have this book, Teach a Survival Guide for New Educators. A lot of people like it and I'm really proud of it. So if you get on Amazon, go ahead and check that out. It uh, comes on Kindle as well. All right, enough about my products. Let's get in. So we're talking 5001 today, big test, four subtests. Um, you, It is scored separately. I'm going to go through an overarching idea of the test specifications, and then I'm going to get into some practice problems, okay? So let me just go here really quick, and I'm going to share my screen all right, let's go here. And I'm just going to talk really quickly. Can you guys see? Yeah, you can. Okay, you can see this. So this is the study guide you got when you signed up for the webinar. It's got tons of information in it. This is just a snippet of the big study guide. But you can see that I have broken up the blueprints here. And under the reading section, I have a lot of information here because the reading section, in my opinion, is one of the hardest sections. Some of you may agree with that or whatever. But And then past that, I have practice problems for each individual section. Then I have the blueprint for the math. Then I have practice problems, you know, for the math. Then I have the blueprint for the social studies. Then I have some practice problems for the social studies. And then I have the blueprint for the um, science section. And then again, practice problems for that. Now, understand too that these answer explanations are very important and that goes with the book as well. Don't skip the answer explanations. There's a lot of good information here. They're almost like their own chapter. So if you're in the free study guide or paid study guide, definitely read those answer explanations. All right. So that's going to be really, really important. And let me just tell you one more thing. I have one more tip of advice for you here. So a lot of people want to just do practice tests over and over and over again to get this information. And practice tests are a really good tool to assess your skills. But this test is huge and has tons of information. And so you really have to understand the concepts. So I'm begging you, I keep doing videos on this. Please stop doing practice tests over and over again, expecting to pass the test. If you're having a hard time, you have to understand the information. That's why I have online courses, YouTube videos that explain these concepts. Okay. This book, look how big it is. All right. It's full of information that's important for you to know. The practice tests are awesome. I know everybody likes to do a practice test to see where they are, but you don't know what questions you're going to get on test day. So relying solely on practice tests for you to understand this information is not going to work. So we really got to dig in. You got to understand the fundamentals of reading, the fundamentals of math, important science and social studies concepts, and really get to know those content categories and test specifications in order to pass this exam. Okay. So just like your students, if your students didn't pass a test, you wouldn't say, take another practice test take another practice test, take another practice test, you would stop and work on the skills that the students were missing. So do that for yourself as well, because this is a big test and it can be difficult. Now, the other thing is, if you pass one or more sections of this test, that's a victory and you should celebrate. Some people get upset because they don't pass all four at once. It's a huge exam. If you pass any of them, that is fantastic. And remember, you can take this test as many times as you need to. I know it's expensive. It's not ideal, but just take the pressure off yourself a little bit and understand that it's it's okay. Um, so just understand that. And then the next thing, what, what else was I going to tell you? It'll probably come to me in the middle of the presentation. All right, let me run over to the chat really quickly. And I see a question here about the 7812. The Praxis 7812, this is comparable because the 7812 is the English language arts. And these two tests are very similar, 7812 and the 5002. 5002 is a section of this book or of the test. 
I am working on a 5006, a 7811, and a 5017 book. They're the other elementary ed exams. They're a little different than the 5001, but if you're here for the English language arts, this is going to help you. The math on those exams are different than the one on this exam, okay? So we're, sp we're talking specifically about the 5001. The 5901 is the same exact test. And... Um, the other content area for teaching for elementary, I'm working on it. Um, I've got some, it's in edits. I'm trying to pump it out as fast as I can, but I want to make sure everything is good with that. Okay. All right. A couple more questions. If you pass one out of the four, can you take it again and skip the one you passed? Yes. Okay. So these tests are scored separately. So if you if you pass like the ELA, but you didn't pass math, social, or, or science, you just take the math, social studies, and science. You do not have to retake anything. They're scored separately. So it's one big test, but four individual subtests. Um, do you have a book for the 190 Foundations of Reading? I do not have a book for the Foundations of Reading, but this teaching reading, lots of people use it to pass the 190. It's very similar. The tests are very, very similar. They um, assess the same things. Okay. Um, should we take the test all at once or in sections? I recommend the first time you take it, take it all at once. All right. If it's too overwhelming for you, then you can sign up for individual ones. The reason why I say take it all at once, because you might get two, you might, you might get one. So just go for it. And then if you're not successful, you can take them individually. All right. All right. So, uh, will you need to wait 30 days to retake? Yes, you have to, it's 29 days, but you have to wait a month. Okay. Can this help the 5007 humanities, language arts and social studies? Um, yes. So this, this particular section is going to be good for the 5007. Yes. Um, but again, I have a specific program coming out very soon for the 5006, which includes the 5007 and the 5008. So I, uh, there's so many numbers, there's so many tests, but let's just focus today on the 5001. You will get um, a lot of information that will help you with the, some people are asking about the EC6, yes. Uh, the Praxis 5901, yes. Um, the FTCE K6, we don't do FTCE, I have to be very very clear about that. This is for the praxis. They are both elementary tests, but this is for the praxis exam. Okay. Um, somebody said I was only studying using practice tests and this is affirmation already that I'm not studying right. Do you think 240 tutoring is efficient enough to pass the praxis? Well, 240 tutoring is my competitor and they do have great stuff, but um, practice tests alone are not going to do it. Okay. All right. So let me go to the next part here and we are going to... We share screen, entire screen, and we should, you guys should see Praxis Elementary Education multiple subjects here. Okay, good. So let's just take a quick look at the blueprint. Now, I always say the blueprint is one of the most important things you can you can look at when you're when you're trying to study for a test. This breaks down all the sections of the test, and you can see here the approximate number of questions. All right, Ooh, I covered up my. Please hold. I covered up my, there we go. All right. So um, it's important to know this. Now notice that the 5002, which is the reading and language arts, is the biggest portion of the test. And it does give people a tough time. The math is also tough on this exam. Yeah, it's elementary, but there's some pretty tough math problems on this exam. So we want to make sure we're prepared here. Four sections, you get four hours and 25 uh, 4.25 hours. So you're talking four hours and uh, four, uh, four hours and 15 minutes there. And it is straight up selected response, meaning it is all multiple choice. There's no writing on this. So that's really good. Okay. Just make sure again that you guys can see me. You guys can see this, right? The screen share on this particular. Okay. Hang on. Let's do it again. How about now? Can you see it now? There you go. I think you can see it now. Okay, cool. Sorry. So this is the blueprint of the exam and you can see four sections, 4.25 hours, and we have the language arts and reading and we have all the questions. Notice the bulk of the test is coming from that reading and language arts there. So this is really important. Now below that, you're going to need to go into the actual specs for the 
subtests. Okay, so right here you can see that now we're in 5002, which is the reading and language arts subtest. And you can see that we have 38 questions are coming from reading and 42 questions are coming from writing, speaking, and listening. So the writing, speaking, and listening is a bigger portion of the reading exam, reading and language arts exam. This portion of the test can be difficult for people, but we're going to go over it today. So the way this is going to work, I'm going to section out each part of the test. I'm going to go over the main components of the specifications, and then we're going to get into specific practice problems, all right? Whenever you see on this presentation something that comes from ETS, you're going to see this ETS study companion on the bottom. And whenever you see a question from the study guide that I gave you when you signed up for this, you're going to see from page eight of the study guide. That way you can follow along with me in the study guide. Okay. All right. Let's go back to here. We are working on the 5002 subtest. And let's talk a little bit about what is on that subtest. So the reading portion of an elementary education exam is going to be everything foundational skills. Okay. So we're talking phonological awareness, phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, comprehension, and there's a big, big importance of metacognition, right? Metacognition is teaching students to use their brains. It's thinking about thinking. Those types of things where we say, okay, uh, how would you figure out this word? Mm, that's a tough word. Let me read around it. And you kind of model those skills of how to use your brain to figure things out. That's a big part of the reading portion. You also have to have a very good grasp on these um, foundational skills. And I cover them in depth in the study guide. And I even cover them in the free study guide. You'll notice that in the, let's see if I can just go over here. Let me go here. You'll see here that I have a lot of information in the reading portion of this free study guide because it's so packed full. So definitely read this part of the study guide. Don't just go to those practice problems because there are really good information. There's really good information here in terms of the, the sections of that exam. Okay. All right. Let's go back to my presentation. All right. So if we're talking about these foundational skills, which are um, the bulk of this test. Let's have a look. This is on page eight of the study guide. So I'll give you a second to flip or click or whatever. And remember my, my, if you've seen some of my videos, you know that I always say start backwards. We're going to start with the answer the answers first. Now, the reason why I do this is because it sets me up to understand what's going on. Now, this particular question only has single you know, single answer choices. They're not like paragraphs, but if this had like a bunch of information in the answer choices, it really helps to work backwards because then you can start to cross out bad information and underline good information. I have a whole video about this on my YouTube channel. It's called work backwards. Definitely check that out. I'm going to give you a tour of my YouTube channel when this is over, but we always want to start backwards. And here I can see, I have phonological awareness, phonics, mastery, phonemic awareness, and structural analysis. So right away, my brain is like, okay, I know that I'm going to have to figure out which skills these students have because these are skills in the answer choices. All right. So now let's read the question. When a student has awareness of phonemes, words, syllables, onset rhymes, segments, and spelling, he or she is demonstrating, well, this is phonological awareness. Now let me show you real quick in a really bad drawing. I also have a video on this. What I want you to do is pretend that phonological awareness... I'm just going to abbreviate, is the umbrella. And underneath it, we have phonemic awareness and phonics. All right. Now, phonemic awareness is sounds only. You don't need to see it. You do not need to write it. You do not need to know that a B, like when you see the letter B, makes a B sound. All you need to do is use your ears. And when I was a reading teacher, my reading coach said, you can teach phonemic awareness in the dark. Meaning if I was like a first grade teacher or a kindergarten teacher, and I said to my students, okay, students say the word bat. And they say bat. And I say, say the word bat. And they say bat. And I say, say the three sounds in bat. And they go, b -a -t. they don't need to know it's a B in the beginning, a T at the end and an A in the middle. They just know the sounds. This is the very beginning piece. And this question is saying all these other things, syllables, words, onset rhymes, segments. That is not phonemic awareness. Phonemic awareness is sounds only. Now, phonics, 
Phonics is when we actually bring in the symbols. So when we see the word B, we know it makes a B sound. When we see, not the word B, the letter B, sorry. When we see the letters P and H together, we know it makes a F sound or an F sound, I should say. And when we see in like, let's say in the word make, when we see a vowel next to a consonant and a silent E, we know this A is long. These rules to symbols using letter symbol correspondence or sound symbol correspondence, this is phonics. You have to see the word. Now, when you combine these things together, you get that phonological awareness. And that's why the answer is A. All right. Let's have a look at another one here. Oops, sorry about that. Let's go back. All right, number three, this is also from page eight in your study guide. Now, again, I'm going to just glance quickly at my answer choices, and I have phonemic awareness, decoding phonics, and structural analysis. Again, these are all skills. So I'm setting myself up to understand what's going on. And then I'm going to keep working backwards. I'm going to go here. Teach students to break words down by individual sounds. Teach students to focus on sounds as they rhyme words. Rhyming is a phonemic awareness activity. Notice I have sounds and sounds. Well, right away, I know it's not decoding. Decoding and phonics are the same thing. And structural analysis is breaking up words. D is out. A, I'm already got A before I even read this part. Let's just read the top part. Based on the following instructional practices, what type of lesson is the teacher focusing on? Well, we have those sounds. We have those sounds. We're not talking about looking at the letter and figuring it out. This is going to be phonemic awareness. All right. Now let's have a look at reading and literature. All right. So let me go here and just see if anybody has any questions. All right. Anybody have any questions? I see. Yes, yes, yes. Meaning you can see my screen. Perfect. Okay. All right. So those are the, let me go back here. Those are the foundational skills for um, reading and you're going to need to know those. And those are in depth in the study guide. Now we're going to talk about the writing, speaking and listening part, which is also very big. We have to teach students how to speak, how to listen actively, how to write the writing process, things like that. And that is going to be a big part of the English language arts exam as well. So let me go here. Let me share my screen again. And we should be good. Yes, we are good. Okay. So now we're um, we're talking also about reading literature and informational text. This is a part of reading. Oh, I said we were going to writing. Actually, there's one more part of the reading. One thing about this exam is you want to make sure that you understand the difference between literary text and informational text. And one big thing on this exam is you got to use them both. Good reading and language arts teachers use a, a balanced literacy program. Now, we're hearing a lot about balanced literacy in politics right now. And uh, people seem to confuse what balanced literacy is. Balanced literacy means that you're using a variety of texts in your classroom. You're using stories. You're using newspaper articles. You're using brochures. You're using timelines. You're, you're using all these different ways in which we get information. And a print rich environment in your classroom is really important. So these words, balanced literacy, print rich, variety of text, those are all good words you want to look for in the answer choices. Okay. You need to know the difference between the two. So informational text is going to be nonfiction. It's going to be, you know, your social studies passages, your science passages, things like that. Literary text is going to be those stories and fables and things like that, that we use in elementary school and middle and high school, you're going to want to focus on text structure. So text structure are things like, is it a cause and effect? Is it descriptive? Is it a narrative? Is it a um, problem solution? Is it chronological? Understanding those will help students sequence events and understand what's going on. Text structure is also important for the writing section because if you're telling students to write a persuasive piece rather than a narrative piece, they need to know the difference between those. And then, of course, text features, right? Headings, um, bolded words, graphs, charts, pictures, those types of things are really important. 
We're always going to be able to compare multiple texts. So will students, here's another good word, text to self. What are we trying to do with students? We're trying to help them see themselves in text. That's why it's so important to have books and stories that represent everyone in the classroom, not just a certain group of people who may be pushing an agenda, but instead all students are represented in literature so that we see students from all different communities, all different genders, all different races, religions, everything. Our, our uh, library should be full of that information. And then of course, this is a big one, evidence-based discussion. We want students to make claims after they read. You know, you might say, how did this happen? Or how does this make you feel? Or what do you think would happen here? You know, we're predicting, we're summarizing and things like that. And when students can back up those claims or support those claims with evidence in the text, that is the key. Because a big part of the English um, reading and language arts standards is that they can say, okay, I think this, right? I think he was mad because of this. And as the teacher, you say, where in the text did you see that? And the student says, right here, it says this. And that is starting to show students that they have to back up those claims with evidence in the text. We start it young. We got to get them using that evidence, using that information. And that really helps. All right, let's have a look at number seven. And this is from page nine in the study guide. So go ahead and turn to page nine. Now in this one, this is a good work backwards one because we have four answer choices with tons of information. And I get a lot of calls from people, well, not calls, emails from people that say, what if there's more than one right answer? What if there's multiple right answers? There is not, unless the question says, choose all that apply or choose two, you know, and you'll get those as well. But this one is asking for one answer. That means there is only one proper answer. Now let's look at the answer choices so I can show you why some of these things are correct and some of them are incorrect. We have A, allow students to partner up and read the text with a buddy. All right, that's a good activity, nothing wrong there. I'm not gonna cross it off, I'll keep it. B, reward students with extra time in the computer lab for finishing reading. Okay, I'm gonna cross that out right away. Rewarding students works. I would probably use this in my own classroom, but on the test, extrinsic rewards are usually not the way you're going to motivate students to finish their reading. We've got to use intrinsic rewards according to this test. Now, I use Jolly Ranchers, chicken sandwiches, extra time, homework passes, all that stuff works. You know it works if you're teaching, but on this test, we're looking for intrinsic rewards, right? C, require the students to finish the reading for homework. Homework is typically a bad word on this test when presented like this. We want to engage students in classwork. Most of these questions are about classwork activities. I'm going to cross off C. And D, allow students to self-select books from a standards-aligned group of informational texts. Has all the good stuff in it. I love D. I'm going to choose D. And I already have the correct answer by working backwards, but let's go ahead and have a look at the question. Um, let's keep working backwards. What can the teacher do to motivate students to engage in reading? Well, self-selecting books is a really good way to motivate students. They get to pick the book they want, but we make sure those books are standards aligned, right? Because we want to make sure we're always using those standards to plan instruction and to you know, choose books and things like that. So that is going to be there. And I didn't even have to read all this stuff up here. doesn't make sense. Okay. So that works there. All right. Now let's talk about writing, speaking, and listening. So in this portion of the reading and language arts, we have the writing process. So the draft, or let's say the pre-writing uh, stage, which is going to be brainstorming, watching a movie, looking at a picture, talking about it. Then we have the drafting stage, the revising stage. We have the rewriting stage. We have the um, editing stage. And I have those all in the book. But the writing process is really important. And one thing about the writing process that is most important is that the re we focus on revision. Nobody writes a perfect paragraph, perfect sentence, perfect book, perfect essay the first time around. We have to teach students that the power is in the revision. And so any answer choices that have to do with focusing on revision is going to be the correct answer. 
Again, for writing and speaking, audience awareness. Who's your audience? Who are you writing to? Who are you speaking to? This is also a skill we need to talk to students about. If you are trying to talk to the school board about a school policy, you're not going to write a narrative, right? You're going to write a persuasive essay to try to persuade the school board. So this you will see on the test, it'll probably have some sort of you know, sample writing, and it might say, how can the student uh, be better at this? And you might say, understanding his or her audience, that kind of thing. So audience awareness is big. And then there's a little bit of grammar and mechanics in there, not a ton, but you do need to understand the fundamentals of grammar and mechanics. And I have that all in the book. It's a huge section and it's the basics, verbs, nouns, compound, complex sentences, punctuation, kind of those basics in grammar for elementary education. And then, of course, oral presentation skills, teaching students how to communicate to the group using graphics, using their voice, using body language. That's all assessed on the exam as well. So let's have a look at what a question might look like from the writing. And again, we have a big old question here, which tends to give people agita. This is from page nine in the study guide. So if you want to turn to that and you can see most people start up here. And that is not where I'm going to start. I'm going to start here. And I might just peek in the question stem here and see the word feedback. All right. So let's have a look at A. You use the term American alligator a lot. Try combining sentences to give the paragraph varied language. Okay. That's pretty good. It talks about varied language. Good word. And um, it's specific. And I'm looking for feedback here. And so specific feedback is really good. So I'm going to keep A. B, good job. Keep up the great work. Nope. Wow, that's a really nice thing to say to your students. It's too vague. It doesn't give them any information on how to what they are good at and what they need to keep going on. That is not uh, appropriate feedback, even though we use it all the time, but we're looking for appropriate feedback, also called specific and meaningful feedback. C, consider using a closing statement at the end. Okay, this is specific but it's just like, boom, here's what you did wrong, right? And so in really good feedback, we want to start with the positive and then hit them with the, this is what you need to work on. So C, I'm going to cross that off. D, your writing does a great job describing your knowledge about the American alligator. All right. So I said a good job, but I was specific about what is actually good. And then I say, consider deleting sentence four so it doesn't take away from your overall theme. Again, I give a critical analysis and I give a suggestion and I say, why? Why do you want to do that? So D is specific and meaningful. It beats out A. I don't even have to read the question, but let's have a look. We have a student writing sample here. He talks about the American alligator, the American alligator. And then we have this sentence here. Um, other apex predators are lions and tigers and it doesn't fit. And so we will want to show the student to take that out. And that's why D is most appropriate there. All right. All right. So let me stop sharing here and let's go back to here. Okay. So how are you guys doing so far? Let's see. Can you answer a question about how many syllables are in a word? Um, it depends on the word, and I can't really answer that right now, but um, you break up the, the word by syllables, by structural analysis. Um, is there a lot of questions about moving sentences in paragraph or deleting them? I struggle with those. Okay, there might be a couple of questions. So on this test, you might have a paragraph that you have to analyze a little bit and see where you can delete and stuff like that. Um, that's more prominent on the Praxis Core Grammar section. But um, for this test, you might have a piece of student writing where you have to do that. Typically, a deleted sentence in a paragraph comes from you know, looking at something and um, when it sticks out like a sore thumb, they want you to do that. It's not that ambiguous on the exam. The, some of these are pretty obvious. I mean, they're obvious to me because I study exams all the time, but you want to look for that piece that is missing. But that's more of a, that those are called rhetorical questions. And rhetorical questions are like this. If the author wanted to make this better, what could the author do? It's like rhetorical, right? So those typically happen on the Praxis Core writing test. You might see one or two, but usually it's like the one I just showed you where you have a student writing and then you have this glaring, like random 
sentence in there and it's like, uh, uh, it's going to be pretty obvious what the student is doing wrong. All right. I wish you were my mentor teacher. Oh, that's very sweet. Good. Thank you for working backwards. Yes. Work backwards guys work backwards on everything. Even if it's just quickly to look, but working backwards will help you get rid of those big, long answer choices that you don't need to think about. Do you have a video on the stages of writing? Um, I do in the online course. So I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Okay. All right. So now let's move on to math, which is also pretty difficult. All right. Let me share my screen here again. All right. You see the math? Yes, you do. You see the math. Okay. This new, this new webinar software, they don't allow me to just select the screen. So I have to do this infinity thing that I hate and I can't really see if I'm sharing. So I've already talked to them and asked them to add it as a feature, but we'll see what happens. Okay. So this is the mathematics subtest. This is 5003. Oops. I just scribbled out my math. Hold on. And this is not easy guys. So most math exams, pretty much all math exams have a numbers and operations, operations section, algebraic thinking, and then geometry, measurement, data, statistics, and probability. Now on higher level math tests, like for middle school or high school, they will section these out, but all math tests assess the same stuff. There's always an operations section. There's always an algebra section. There's always a geometry section. There's always a probability and data section. And then if you go a little higher, there'd be like pre-calc, things like that. But all uh, elementary ed tests assess the same math skills. Now, in some elementary ed tests, you have to figure out where the student made the mistake and how you would teach it, but you have to understand the skills in themselves and be able to do the math in order to figure that out, okay? So we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Notice that the bulk of the exam for the math, 40%, comes from numbers and operations, and this includes all types of skills. I'm going to show you that in a minute. And then these two here are broken up the same, 30%. All right. So really focus in on those numbers and operations, but you're going to have to understand all skills to get this. And again, it's elementary, but there's like some hard algebra on this. There's a couple of, uh, about the coordinate plane. Um, it's, it's a tough exam. It ain't easy. All right. So let's talk about numbers and operations. This is 40% of the math exam. It's huge. So you're going to have more basic things like place value. You might have um, even some things like number representation by like the number of blocks. How can we show that to students? It's going to be pretty basic. But then we get into PEMDAS, orders of operation, parentheses, exponents, multiplication, division, adding and subtracting. Remember these two can be interchangeable depending on which one goes first. I have a bunch of videos on that. But orders of operation, how do you solve these problems properly? You will have questions on exponents, fractions, which I know some of you cannot stand, decimals, percents, and proportions are a big one on the numbers and operations. I always say in my math videos that if you can do a proportion, you can solve a lot of questions in the algebra section, in the geometry section. That piece of information and those skills is going to help you a lot. Let's have a look at a proportion. So if I'm working backwards, I can see that A, B, C, and D are just numbers, so I can't really do anything there. And let's have a look at the question stem. In math, I always go to the question stem. At this rate, how many sandwiches can he make in a four hour shift, all right? So I know right away it's a proportion because it's saying at this rate, how many can he do? That's another keyword that it's a proportion. Now let's have a look up here. Ryan works at a sandwich shop and can make 35 sandwiches in 50 minutes. All right, so let's do it matchy matchy. 35 sandwiches over 50 minutes. So I have sandwiches over minutes. Okay. And for this one, I want to do sandwiches over minutes. Well, I don't have, it's asking me how many sandwiches. So I don't know how many sandwiches he can make, but he, it says it, can he make in a four hour shift? So he makes 35 and 50 minutes. How many can he make in four hours? Well, notice I have minutes and hours here. So I need to convert four in four hours into minutes. So I simply multiply four times 60 and I get 240. Make sure you have matchy matchy when it comes to your units. And in this case, we want to keep it in um, minutes. It's easier that way. Otherwise, 50 minutes is like point something, something of an hour and it just becomes kind of annoying. So I just went to minutes here. So again, I have sandwiches over minutes equals sandwiches over minutes. Same on the top, same on the bottom, matchy matchy. Now I'm going to cross multiply and solve. I have 35 times 240 
and I get 8,000, there we go, 400. So I cross multiplied these two. 8,400 equals 50X, all right? Cross multiply here, cross multiply. So then I divide by 50, divide by 50, and 840 divided by 50 is 168. The answer is A. All right, so again, in this, in this question, you can see we have three out of the four things. I have sandwiches and minutes, and I need sandwiches and minutes, but I only have here, I have hours, but we turned it into minutes. I need to figure out that fourth thing, the sandwiches. I set up my proportion matchy matchy, I cross multiplied, and I got 168, okay? All right, so now let's go to algebraic thinking. Algebraic thinking can be pretty tough. You're going to have to work on expressions and equations, linear relationships, formulas for unknown quantities. Again, proportions are in the algebraic thinking. Notice that if I go back to here, this is an algebraic equation. It's part of numbers and operations, but I had to use algebra to solve it. So a lot of these things are intermingled when it comes to your um, skills. So be on the lookout for that. And then turning verbal statements into algebra. People tend to have a hard time with that, where it says, you know, you get a word problem, you have to turn it into an algebraic equation. It's not easy. Well, what might this look like on the test? Well, let's just have a look at this algebraic equation. I mean, this is elementary. This is hard. This is on page 12 of your study guide. All right, so I mean, this to me feels tough for elementary. I don't remember doing this in elementary school, but of course the standards have gotten higher for kids. So we have evaluate the equation for B equals negative four, okay? So we have, we have the B here. So what we need to do is we need to input this negative four everywhere we see B. So let's just write it out. So I have, I have room here, negative, and I'm gonna put this in parentheses times negative four, squared minus three times negative four. Now, we got a lot of negatives and this is where people get messed up. I was just going through this with my daughter. Remember your negatives, check for your negatives because on standardized assessments, they always do this. They put a ton of negatives, all right? So if we're working in PEMDAS, all right, we could do the parentheses first. It, you could move this through here, but this is actually multiplication because you're multiplying by a negative one. And that would be here because this is essentially, this negative is a negative one, okay? So we're not gonna do that one first. Oops, let me go to my eraser. We're gonna do the exponent first because that's my next thing in the equation. Yes, there are parentheses here, but that's only to separate the items. When we talk about parentheses, we're talking about things like, something like that that's holding a big part of it, okay? Now that's not part of this particular question, so I'll go ahead and erase it there. But let's do the exponent, that's my next order of operation, and I have negative four to the second power, which is negative four times negative four. Negative times a negative gives you a positive, okay? And let me just, I like to, when I'm demonstrating this, take it one step at a time, okay? Now we can do the multiplication. So essentially, I'm taking this negative 1 and multiplying it by 16, which gives us negative 16. Then I, be careful, bringing all my negatives down, minus what is 3 times negative 4? That's going to be a negative 12. Now a bunch of people get freaked out when they see negative, uh, minus a negative. Anytime you see minus a negative, this turns into plus a positive. All right? So we have negative 16 plus 12 is going to be negative 4B is the answer there. All right. All right. Let's have a look at geometry, measurement, and data. This is a big section as well, and it covers a ton of stuff because not only do you have geometry, but you have all that probability. So you're going to have to know one, two, three-dimensional figures, perimeter, area, volume, circumference. There are a little bit of circles on there. Units of measurement, meaning meters to kilometers, things like that. Central tendency, mean, median, and mode. That's a big part of the uh, probability portion. You're going to have to evaluate charts and graphs and tables. Again, we have proportions. You will use proportions to solve these problems as well. And you have that probability. What's the probability of rolling a six? What's the probability of choosing a blue sock? What's the probability of, you know, whatever? So um, those will be usually in a word problem. And I have one right here for you. 
All right. So I see in my answer choices that I have some fractions. And let's have a look at the question stem. If the cube is rolled four times and a five is rolled each time, what is the probability of the cube landing on a five for the sixth time? Okay, so we have a cube. Let's go up here. A six-sided cube has numbers one through six. So it's a, it's a die, all right, with dots on each side. So this is a die. I have one of them, not two, one. If the cube is rolled four times and, five, and a five is rolled each time, what is the probability of rolling another five? The probability of rolling a five does not change. There are six possible outcomes because there's a one, a two, a three, a four, a five, and a six on a die. And to roll a five is one, poss one possibility, one over six. It doesn't matter how many times you roll it. It doesn't increase your probability. You still have a one out of six chance of rolling a five. All right. So A is the correct answer there. I go into probability in depth in the book and in the online course. So if the, you struggle with this, you're not alone. A lot of people struggle with the probability, but it ends up being pretty easy once you um, have an understanding. All right, we've got some geometry here, perimeter. And I have these answer choices here. I'm not sure what I'm doing here, but let's have a look. We can see though that it's all in, if I really wanted to be think like a test maker, which I try to do, you can see that they are all in sevens, seven, 14, 21, 28, all divide, can be divisible by seven. So that gives me a clue. What is the perimeter of a square with an area of 49 inches? Again, this is in units in, of seven. And also if you had some outlier here, like E is 53, you would know that probably E is not going to be working out here because we're all in un, uh, sevens. So just a little quick advice there. Do, this is not part of it. But if you had some weird number, it's probably not going to be the answer. So anyways, let's have a look. So we have, we're looking for the perimeter, but we only have the area. So a square is four equal sides and we know the area equals 49. Well, if it's a square and all sides are equal, what times what equals 49? Well, seven times seven equals 49. Well, I'm not looking for area. I'm looking for perimeter, which means all of the sides because it's a square are seven. And so I add all of them up or I can multiply seven by four and I get D 28 inches there. All right. All right, so let me go back to my presentation here, see how you guys are doing. All right. Um, if you are truly stuck on the question of selection, see a good guess. I can't see which question we're talking about, Chris. Sorry, I was sharing my screen. I can't see the comment. So if you want, you can put in a little um, comment and I'll try to figure out what you're talking about. Kathleen's Praxis book from Amazon was so helpful. I passed the reading, writing, and math the first time. Awesome. Do you tutor individually? No, I don't. You can see there's a hundred people on this webinar, thousand people signed up. I just don't have enough hours in the day to do individual one-on-one -on -one tutoring, but my online courses are very, very comprehensive and I'm there with you for every problem. I go through every problem in the book. Um, did I miss the writing portion of the reading? Did you cover it? Yes, I did. It was, um, slide. It was, uh, just a few minutes ago. I'll jump back to that. How to prepare for the math when you have math anxiety. Okay. So a couple things about math. Um, a lot of people have math anxiety. I get it. You have to challenge that thinking because you're going to be teaching students and they're going to have math anxiety. And we get this in our head. I'm a reading and language arts person. I'm not a math person. That's not true. You're a math person. You just have to practice your math. And the way you do that is by really understanding the concepts and skills and challenging that voice in your head that says, you suck at math. You don't suck at math. You just haven't practiced it enough. Everybody can be good at math. So I'll give you an example. I thought I was a reading and language arts person. And then I got chosen to teach biology in high school. And biology was my worst subject in high school. I thought I was not into science and I didn't like it. It wasn't my thing. And I was a writer and I was, you know, that's what I studied in college. No, I'm not a biology person. When I got thrown into the fire and became a biology teacher, I fell in love with it because I had to relearn it because I was teaching it. <laughs> And it was amazing. And so there's always time to relearn these skills and to practice them. So I would check out my math YouTube 
uh, playlist. If you need more help in this area, I have an online course, but you've got to challenge that kind of negative self-talk about math. And because your students are going to do it too, and we don't want them to do that. You want to be a real well-rounded, you don't have to be a math genius, but you got to challenge that thinking, say something different to yourself. Okay. Um, YouTube videos have helped. Awesome. Butterfly effect when multiplying. Yes, I'm sorry. I messed up that proportion. Live TV, you know how it is. Are we able to use a calculator on the Praxis exam? Yes, you can use a four-function calculator on this test. It's on screen, so be real careful when you input it in. But yes, you can use a calculator. Um, they have a calculator you can see. Yes, I got this question correct. Good. I'm in Texas. How similar is the test to Texas? This will help you with the EC6 in Texas, Laura. Um, I am taking for Missouri. How does this work? I'm not sure which test you're taking for Missouri. I'm not sure if it's the 5001 or another, but if it's an elementary ed test, this is going to help you. And again, I'm in Texas. Yes, Texas, it will help. Okay. What time is it? Oh my God. We got two more sections. Let's keep moving. All right, guys, here we go. Now we're moving on. <laughs> I always go way too long. All right. We should be able to be here. Okay. So let me just make sure again, you can see it. Yes, you can. Okay. So now we're in the social studies section, not as difficult as the math and the ELA. This is more of like just memorizing random social studies stuff. If you haven't taken a social studies class in 20 years, this, you got to brush up on this stuff. It's going to ask you about the branches of government. It's going to ask you about the bill of rights. It's going to ask you about the war of 1812. I mean, just things you have the potato famine, you know, these are things <laughs> we don't normally think about. All right. So if you haven't taken a social studies class in a while, you're going to really need to brush up on this. So again, there are three sections to the social studies exam. All social studies tests assess U.S. history, government and citizenship, geography, sociology, world history, and economics. All social studies tests assess this. Now, as you get up in the higher grades, like I mentioned with math, you will get more specific. But for all social science exams, these are basically the... Um, the classes within the social studies department. If you went to a high school, there's a U.S. history class, there's a government class, there's a geography class, that kind of thing. So these are all the disciplines within social studies, right? And you can see the bulk of it is going to be on U.S. history and citizenship, but there is going to be a little bit on econ. There's some tough economics questions on this test. So we want to make sure we understand that. So let's have a look at U.S. history and government and citizenship. You are going to talk a little bit about European exploration of the Americas here when the Europeans came over and what happened. And so we want to, we want to make sure we understand that. Um, the American revolution, obviously that's going to be a big one, major events, civil war, westward expansion. And these are all coming from the test specifications. You can find these in the test specs. I'll show you how to get those in a second. Key documents, of course, declaration of independence, constitution, that should say Federalist Papers, not Feudalist Papers, sorry. That should say Federalist Papers. Uh, branches of government and then citizens and responsibilities want to teach students about civics, all right? So let's have a look at what that might look like. Now, this might seem easy for some of you, but some of you may not have thought about this in a while, although you should because there are a lot of things coming up in the judicial branch that you might be interested in. And we should all stay um, informed on that. So we have our answer choices here, makes laws, enforces laws, interpret laws, implements policy. All right, let's have a look at the question. Which of the following describes the duty of the judicial branch of the U.S. government? Okay, so the legislative branch makes laws. Okay, the legislative branch makes laws. Now, enforces laws, there, there really is none that really, uh, you know, enforces laws. I mean, that's usually done at the local level or the federal level with the U United States Department of Justice. Um, but the judicial branch interprets laws. Okay. So what do I mean by this? Well, let's say that the president signs an executive order or a state legislature signs, you know, puts a bill and puts a law in effect and it makes it all the way to the Supreme court or it makes it to the, um, the state Supreme Court, right? Or the federal court. That court will then interpret, is it constitutional? Should it be done this way? Blah, blah, blah. So that's what happens with the judicial branch. They interpret the laws. Now remember the four, the four, the three branches of government are there to provide checks and balances. So for example, like I just said, the president can do an executive order, right? 
or um, the Congress can pass a law, but the judicial branch is the check on that because someone can bring that to the judicial branch and say, hey, I don't think this law is constitutional. And then the judicial branch rules on that. So all those checks and balances are important. Make sure you know that for the exam. Now, the next part is geography, anthropology, and sociology. And some of these geography questions, you guys, they're tough too. You're going to have questions about like an isthmus and, and mountain ranges and things like that. And that can be difficult. So we want to talk about world geography and concepts. What's going on? It might ask you about Pangea. It might ask you about um, the continents and, and the different countries and things like that. So we need to know that. Physical and human systems. How do humans affect the environment? This is a big one in elementary. We want to make sure kids understand how cities and cars and buildings and things like that kind of affect the physical environment. Cultures, this is that anthropology and sociology portion of the social studies. And then people, migration, settlements, both past and present. All right. Let's have a look at what that might look like on the exam. So answer choices here. We have intensive farming, sustenance farming, pastoral farming, and extensive farming. Let's read the question. Don't know what to do what to do here. Which of the following terms is used to describe agriculture? So we have farming, 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 where large parcels of land are cultivated using machinery rather than uh, manual labor. So machinery rather than manual labor is going to be intensive farming. Okay. So intensive farming is when you get a bunch of land and you use a ton of machinery and it's kind of what we do now. Pastoral farming is when you use livestock and then extensive farming is when you use more labor and not machinery. All right. So six is a there. Let's have a look at world history and econ. Those are kind of smushed together on this test. We have ancient civilization, so you need to know what the Greeks contributed, what the Romans contributed, what the Chinese civilizations contributed, all of that. Developments of the 20th century, so, you know, cars, um, uh, the space program, um, all the different things. I can't really think of all of them on the top of my head, but of course there have been so many in the 20th century. The 20th century was huge when it came to developments. Cross-cultural comparisons, so what's happening in different areas of the world. Basic econ, supply, demand, scarcity, choice, those types of things. And then, of course, population, resources, and impact. That does have to do with economics, population, density, what's happening with resources and how that impacts the world economy. Let's have a look at what that looks like. Which of the following example is an, uh, sorry, starting with the answer choices here. All right, we have when a country produces goods at a lower opportunity cost than its competitors. When a country has an economic surplus and its trading partner has an economic shortage. When a country specializes in the product they are most efficient at producing and trades for products that other countries are most efficient at producing. And D, when a country only, we see this word only, exports pr uh, products. Now, when we talk about only, this is what I call strong language in testing. Typically, if you are stuck and you see the word only or only, or always or never is typically not the right answer. It doesn't mean it can't be sometimes, but typically this is what we call strong language in testing. And they will put this in to make a somewhat correct answer, a wrong answer. So I'm going to cross off D just because it has only. Now, I don't know enough about what's going on in order to answer this, but I did get one taken off by going backwards. Okay. Which of the following is an example of an absolute advantage? All right, an absolute advantage is when a country has the resources, the specialty to make a certain product and everybody else has to kind of buy from that country, all right? And you can see, I mean, I don't know of an, an example of a total absolute advantage, but I would say something like maybe... Uh, computer chips right now. Um, there are certain countries that have an absolute advantage. We are trying to get back into the computer chip game um, or semiconductors, things like that. But it's when a country specializes in the product and they are most efficient. Notice those words, specialize, most efficient. Those give you an advantage. Even if you didn't know what was going on here, those keywords would help you. All right. And it gives them an advantage because I can, if I, if I specialize and I produce it the best, 
I can set the price at whatever I want. And they do. And so that's how that works there. All right. All right. Let's go back here and see if we have any questions. Um, as you continue to create content, will you produce material for secondary education? Yes, I will. I have two secondary education books for English language arts. I have a third one coming out. I'm going to be working on some social studies stuff. So yes. Any advice on how to overcome test anxiety? So with test anxiety, a couple things you should know. It's common. First off, you do not need a hundred on this test. You need like a low C, high D to pass this exam. So try to get that out of your mind a little bit. The second thing is, is that you can take the test as many times as you need to. And so if it takes you two times, three times, four times, I know that's not ideal and it's expensive, but you've got to think in terms of, I do not need an A, I need a D. Sometimes you need an F. All right. And on some of the harder exams, a low F, like the physics and the chem for high school, you can get a really low score. So nobody's asking you to be perfect on this exam. And if you prepare properly and you really read and understand, you will eventually pass. You will pass. You've got to, you've got to calm down. <laughs> and I know that's hard when you have anxiety, but um, what I typically do if I'm going to take a difficult exam, I listen to some really good music on my way there. And I remember that I can take this test as many times as I want. Beyond that, it's hard to get over anxiety. And so it might be uh, another underlying cause there. Um, but that's going to be my advice to you. You can take it as many times as you want and you don't need an A. You need like an F, high D to pass. Okay. All right. Any tips for the science part? Uh, oh, you're taking it at 12 today. All right. We're doing science. Uh, Paula, let's go. We're doing science right now. Here we go. Okay. Let's talk science. Let me just make sure we're on science. Yes, we are. Okay. Here we go. The science test, always going to have the same content categories. We have earth science, which is going to be the sun, moon, stars, things like that. Life science, which is going to be biology, cells, ecosystems, animals, human systems, and then physical science. Those are going to be your uh, machine questions, energy questions, magnetism, uh, electricity, things like that. Okay. Now with this, it's a lot of memorization of stuff, but if you know where the questions are coming from, it will really help you. So for earth science, we have earth, moon, sun, and stars, earth systems. So, um, you know, the, 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 uh, hydrosphere, how it works, water evaporates, goes up into the clouds, things like that. You're going to need to understand that earth spheres, biosphere, cryosphere, lith, lithosphere, all of that, the earth's crust, that's the lithosphere and what happens below it. And remember, if you get a question on the exam about how to increase, you know, student engagement or anything like that, inquiry, inquiry, inquiry based learning, getting their hands dirty, looking at a rock, touching a rock rather than just reading about a rock. Okay. And that's going to be really important here. Let's have a look at a question you might see on the earth's aqua or on earth space science. So we have here beneath the earth's crust, beneath the earth's bedrock in the core in the earth's mantle. So we have, where are the earth's aquifers located? Now, one of the things with science, we can kind of use our common sense here. Aquifers are where we get our, our water and it's definitely not in the earth's core. So that's out. In the Earth's mantle, again, way too deep. You're talking hundreds of thousands, not hundreds of thousands, I don't, th thousands of miles deep into the Earth. There's no way to extract water from there. It's not hundreds of thousands. That would be, we would have a very large planet if it were hundreds of thousands of miles, but it's going to be several miles into the Earth and it's, it's too, um, it's too deep, right? Now we have this bedrock and crust. Well, think of bedrock. Bedrock is really hard. It's going to be hard to extract water from the bedrock. It's just below the earth's crust at the saturation point. That's where we're going to get the water from our aquifers. So even if you narrowed it down 50, 50, you'd have a good chance, but the core and the mantle, these are way too deep into the, into the earth. Now, life science, and it's good to know these questions, like where these questions are coming from. You're going to get stuff on cell theory, Parts of the cell, human systems, interdependence, organisms and ecosystems, life cycles, and again, inquiry is huge on the science. So let's have a look at what that looks like. So I can see from the answer choices, I'm talking about 
cell division, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. And I might be like, oh my gosh, I don't, I didn't brush up on that. Well, let's have a look at the question. During this stage of mitosis, chromosomes line up in the middle of the cell and spindle fibers attached to the center of the chromosomes match middle and metaphase up together. You will probably get a question like this on the exam. Um, I always like to use the metaphase example because meta and middle match up and it's very common to see a question about metaphase on the life science portion of any exam. So make sure you know your, your, um, your stages of cell division and you don't have to get into it too much. Just know the names and the stages of each uh, point of the cell division. All right. And now let's go to physical science. So with physical science, physical and chemical changes, uh, forces in motion, electricity, forms of energy, machines, lever, pulley, wedge, and of course, again, inquiry. All right. So physical changes are things like breaking, ripping, tearing. Chemical changes is when the chemical makeup actually changes like rust. Rust is because of something that happens with oxidization and it changes the molecular makeup of a substance. And that's why it's called a chemical change. A physical change is just when something changes physically. Okay. Like ice, melting ice. It's still H2O. It's just in ice form. When I melt it, it's still H2O, okay? So make sure you know the difference with that. Forces in motion is going to be one. And in fact, I have a good one here. will help explain uh, different uh, energies. So we have this cute little diagram here, a guy on a motorcycle. And it says, at what point is the potential energy highest? Okay, think of a pendulum or this situation. Potential energy is when something has the potential to move. And if we're up here in A, we are ready to go. If we're on a swing and the swing is all the way up here and it's getting ready to go down here, that's potential energy. If I hold my pen in the air and before I drop it, that has potential energy. Okay. The potential energy is highest at the top. Just like if I hold this pen up in the air and I drop it, the potential energy is highest when it's at the top. Once it hits the floor, the potential energy is virtually zero. So the highest potential energy is here. And remember this, the highest kinetic energy is here. That's when the, the um, thing is going as fast as it will go. Okay. And so potential and kinetic energy is on the, this exam. So make sure you know that. All right. So let me stop sharing there and let's go back here. Okay. So potential energy equals energy at rest. Yes, yes, yes. All right. Yes. Good luck, Paula, on your exam. If you do have the study guide, go ahead and review all of that. All right. This is bringing us to the end. So I do want to show you, a, it's not bad, only 10 minutes over. Usually I go like, way too long. Okay. So really quickly, this is the book that, that I made the study guide for. So, um, but I used this book, the Praxis to elementary. I have the same book for the five, nine, zero one. If you're waiting for the seven, eight, one, one, the five, zero, one, seven and the five, zero, zero, six, it's in the works. Okay. Um, let me show you where you can get it. And when you get the email today, from me, you're going to get an offer code um, to buy the book. So I'm just going to give it to you here. It's Praxis EE20. All right. So I'm going to put it in the chat here. Praxis EE20. And I'll throw it in the um, I'll throw it in the email you get. If you're watching live on YouTube or Facebook, that's the word Praxis. EE as an elementary education 20, and that will give you 20% off. All right. Now, um, really quickly, if you, let me share my screen here. Let's go to, okay. So I have just the study guide, which is great. I showed it to you. It's over 400 pages, over 600 five-star reviews, all that. But let's say you need more support. Some of you need more support in the math. Somebody talked about math anxiety. Somebody talked about needing more help in science. In these online courses, there are videos and extra practice and things like that. In fact, let me go. This is what the online online course looks like. So you can see for the Praxis um, 5001, 
you can, or 5002 foundational skills, all of this information here, all of this information. It's got flashcards, it's got videos, and it has full practice tests at the end. Um, and it gives you a score. And of course, it's got the answer explanations to tell you why. Let's just hop on over to math really quickly. So you can see so much content in the online course. Look at all these videos. I mean, it just, there's so much to go through in this course. So if you need a lot of extra help, this will help you. And again, in all of this, you can get the online book, the digital book. I separated it in this course so that you download the 5002 separately, the 5003 separately, because it's just easier that way. Um, but when you buy it, it, it all comes uh, at once if you buy the digital study guide. So this is going to help you a lot. And again, I have the social studies, tons of videos to explain, you know, um, European exploration, all of that. You can see here the American revolution and the videos are anywhere from like five to some of them are 20 minutes depending. And then of course I've got here for the, um, science, all the science concepts. It's got like interactive stuff you can click on people like that. Earth's processes. Let's go down to life science, which is my favorite. And so you can see here cell theory and all these different diagrams I do and video slides and things like that. So there's a lot here. All right. And so that will help you. Okay. How effective are flashcards for each content area? Flashcards are awesome. If you want to do flashcards, that's fantastic. Um, can you go back to the 5002 writing portion? Yes. I'll just hop back there really quickly. Um, Jennifer is asking about the 5002 writing portion. So let me just hop back to my thing here and let me go to writing. Let's see here. Okay, right here. Writing, speaking, and listening. We talked about how the writing process and the revision is most important here. You need to know the steps of the writing process. I do go over that in the book and in the online course, and I have um, a video on it on my YouTube channel audience awareness, making sure students understand what they're writing to, who they're writing to is really important. There's a little piece of grammar and mechanics there, elementary ed specific. And then of course we have to teach students the um, writing, speaking and listening skills. And the question that I went over was this appropriate feedback question. Notice that answer D, we're giving feedback to students on their writing. This right here is a little piece of writing that the student did. And when you give feedback, you need to make sure that you have specific and meaningful feedback, meaning you talk about why something is good and why something is not good. This good job, keep up the good work is not a good enough uh, feedback. So what you want to do is D talks about, it gives a little praise. You did a great job. Uh, talking about the American alligator. So it's specific. And then we have a critique, consider doing this. And that is also specific. So that's really important for the writing. All right. Now, again, I'm only um, scratching the surface here, you guys. It's a, it's a, it's a huge exam. So there's going to be a lot more there. Uh, for the 502 and the 503 portions, will there be fill in the blank questions? I don't, think there are fill in the blank questions, but again, you could get it. I don't know. I mean, they could do a fill in the blank question. Try not to focus too much on that. You don't know what questions you're going to get. So you got to understand that information really good. Uh, Jimmy Khan Wilson, life science is my favorite too. Thank you for all the help and resources is very informative. Awesome. Will this study guide assist with the K6 exam? Listen, I don't do uh, FTCE. This is for the praxis, okay? But it will help you with lots of different elementary ed exams. Thank you for all your help. What else can you recommend for the foundations of reading? The thing that I recommend for the foundations of reading is this praxis, my praxis um, teaching reading book. You can get that on my website. It covers all the same stuff. Latrice, for the online course, what are the costs for those, please? And do you offer a discount? Yes, the discount code I just put in the chat, it's Praxis EE. So Praxis, the name of your test, EE as an elementary education 20. And I'm going to send that out in an email in about an hour. So you'll be able to do that. So just go to the um, website. You got to go all the way to checkout and you can enter that discount code. How long does it take for the scores to come in? Are they online or mailed? Alex D. Good question. All right. So you're, you, 
most of the time you get an immediate score for each section. You'll see it pop up on the screen. Be careful. Sometimes you miss it. So you'll see a, a score pop up on the screen. Now, not always. If they're, you know, in the test, working on some items, things like that, they won't give you a score right, right away. And then a few weeks later, you'll get it in an email. Now, people will say, does your... Um, online score match your official score. Typically, if you have a passing score on the screen when you're done, that is going to translate to your official score. It's very rare that your official score does not match your unofficial score. The unofficial score is the one that pops on the screen, but it could, but it's rare. All right. Um, Praxis EE20. Yes, that is the offer code. Do you have anything for the 5543? Oh yeah, guys, let's have a look at my products here. Okay. Because somebody's asking about the PLT K6 um, all of that. So let me just do a quick little share on my products really quickly. Cause some of you are looking for more stuff. All right. So on this homepage, you can see I've got my new webinars coming up. So if you need the Praxis teaching reading or the, um, the Pearson 190 or any teaching reading exam, the Texas, um, the, uh, teaching reading exam, you're going to want to come to this May 6th. We're doing all just teaching reading. And if you're struggling on the 5002, this May 6th webinar is going to be great. You just click here and it'll take you to the page with all the different webinars on it. Okay. Now for all my different study guides, let me just go to my study guide page. Hang on, please hold. Study guides. Look at all of them. And I've got more. Now, some of you are asking about the PLT. I know that test so well. I wrote an amazing guide for it. I have the 5622, I have the 5621, 5623, and 5624, all grade levels. All right. For high school, I have the ELA. This is the 5039 and the 5038. 5039 has writing. The 5038 does not. I've got physical education, 5091, 5095. 5095 has the writing. Same test. Don't buy two. It's the same test. I've got GACE. This is basically the same thing as the Praxis Core. I've got Leadership, Praxis um, 5402. You may not be ready for that. And then these are our biggest sellers. We have the Teaching Reading Elementary. This one's huge. You can use this for the STAR, any teaching reading exam. Then 190, Praxis Teaching Reading. And this is going to help you out a lot. This is what we just used today, the elementary ed. These two are the same, these books, except this 5901 here, it does not have the... Uh, English language arts and reading. People who take the 5901 have to take this. So you get the reading there. I've got ESOL that will help you with any ESOL exam. I've got the core. Many of you have to take that. Early childhood. I've got a study guide and an online course for that. And the SLLA when you're ready for leadership. And then I have the um, special education. Now, also, if you go to online courses, let me go back to home so I can get you all the online courses. I have online courses for tons of it. And I just did a new interview, teacher interview prep. That one is an online course and it comes with some templates and things like that. And so these are all my online courses. I have early childhood. I have all the different PLTs. I have bundles, ESOL, all of this, and I'm developing more. This one is for the 7813 and the 5008 math. This comes with a study guide. They all come with study guides. All right. And then finally, if you want some more free stuff, go to my free webinar tab. And I have all these different free webinars. I am updating that. So today I did the elementary education. This is this is an old one. So if you want to do another one, you can do that one. And then this is the new one that will replace it. I'm doing SLLA and Praxis 5412 next week, next weekend. And then I'm doing a new teaching reading on May 6th. Okay. But I have these Praxis core webinars. Check this out. Check out how, how much stuff you get. Let me just go here. When you click here. You get a study plan, you get practice court. Look at all these videos. So when you, when you sign up for these webinars, you're going to get a study plan. You're going to get uh, resources. These are study guides and all of that. And so the free stuff is really good. So make sure you check out the free stuff and of course the online courses. And we have a bunch of new blogs out. This one's a really good one. Um, how to calculate your praxis score. This one will help you calculate. Some of you have questions on that. So I just have a bunch of resources there. Now, any questions on that? Um, what is the basic difference between the 5001 and the 5018? Um, the 5001 is all content driven. So like for the 
um, math and for the science and for the social social studies. It's just knowing those concepts with the um, 5018. It's teaching them. So you're going to have teaching scenarios rather than just straight up content. Will you have an online course for students with disabilities? Yes, I'm working for, uh, working on a course to go with my book, but if you need it now, let me show you. I have a whole playlist for special ed on my YouTube channel right here. Let me go here. You can see that I have all of these videos here for Praxis Special Education. So on my YouTube channel, you're gonna see a lot of that. So make sure you be quiet, Kathleen Jasper. There we go. I would definitely check out my YouTube channel, subscribe and all of that. That will help you um, out there. Also, I have TikTok. I'm doing a lot of stuff on TikTok where I'm doing shorter videos like this one's on Blooms. I do some ACT, grammar tips. I'm trying some different stuff, shorter versions here. And then of course, my Facebook page here. Um, and this will all help you, you know, joining the Facebook page. If you go into groups, I have a group for teacher certification exams, leadership, and to go with my new book, Teach a Survival Guide for New Educators. So definitely check that out. All right. So we're coming to the end. Will you have a webinar for the 5543 Praxis? Yes, I'm going to do one. Right now I'm focusing on these three, the 5001, the SLLA, and the 5412. And then the following week will be the 5205, the teaching reading. But yes, I will definitely um, check that out. Chris Smith, Praxis 5001 and 5002, will it cover all sections? Okay, this is how it works. The 5001 is the full test. That has the 02, the 03, the 04, and the 05. The 5002 is just English language arts. So if you need all of them, you got to buy the whole thing. If you just need to pass one, then you can buy individual subtests. Okay. Teaching mentally challenged children. Anything for this class? I've been subbing a lot. Um, for teaching uh, students with disabilities, you can definitely check out my special education playlist on YouTube and the resources on my website. Um, Dr. Jasper, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, Cecilia, I already have a webinar for the 502. Two five go under free webinars on my website. It's there. What about the science of teaching reading? Yes, this book will help you with the STR. Okay, it'll help you with any teaching reading exam. Lots of people pass using that book. I specialize in secondary education with no prior elementary skills, but want to teach elementary. Will this book help without me doing another four years in college? The book will definitely help, uh, but you know, it's hard to put it all in one book, but the book will definitely help. A lot of people use the books to kind of teach them how to teach as well. Okay. I just want to let you know, I truly appreciate you. Well, thank you so much, Arlene. I appreciate that. Thank you guys so much. All right. Now be on the lookout for the email coming from me. It's going to have all the stuff in it. The offer code will be in there. The links will be in there. And, you know, I'm just so thrilled you're here. Thank you so much for being a part of this community. I love doing these. I'll see you next week for the leadership. Even if you're not here for leadership, you just started teaching. It never hurts to kind of have a look at what the leadership exams are like because you guys might be leaders not too long. You know, I became an assistant principal about four years after I started teaching. So if you are thinking, Hey, I want to go all the way with this. It's free. Join me next week. All right, guys. So let me know if you need anything, have a wonderful day and be on the lookout for that email. Bye.